Welcome to this PowerPoint presentation on how to use DNA GEDCOM to analyze your DNA results. This is a repeat of a session that was done originally for the Southwest Ohio DNA Interest Group and was repeated on June 20th for the Central Ohio DNA Interest Group. What is DNA GEDCOM? DNA GEDCOM was founded by Rob Worthen and went online in February of 2013. It has become the state-of-the-art website to gather your DNA data. In addition, Rob and others have produced tools and programs to help you sort out your information and better understand it. The team originally developed these tools in association with many users who were trying to identify biological parents. It became the go-to site for adoptees trying to make sense of the DNA results that they had. DNA GEDCOM serves as an umbrella for several programs. Data can be uploaded from the major autosomal DNA companies, including Ancestry, Family Tree DNA, 23andMe, and GEDmatch. One of the things that was confusing for me when I first started using this program is when I realized that it is actually more than one program. There are utilities in there that enable you to create spreadsheets. JWorks does this in conjunction with an Excel spreadsheet. KWorks is a web-based spreadsheet tool. KWorks is a web-based tool. GWorks compares GEDCOMs that have been uploaded to the program. And my favorite utility is the Autosomal DNA Segment Analyzer. And that's what we're going to mainly focus on tonight. If you've heard of the program Genome Mate Pro, one of the things you'll realize right off the bat is it relies on files that have been processed in DNA GEDCOM to be uploaded in order to take advantage of its abilities. I'm privileged because next week I'm going to attend a GRIP session, which stands for the Genealogical Research Institute of Pittsburgh, and I'm going to take an advanced genetic genealogy course on chromosome mapping. We're going to use a small version of Genome Mate Pro, but in order to do that, I had to get ready by using DNA JetCom in advance of the class to start setting up some of the files that I'll use there. So if you've heard of that program, which in my opinion is a very advanced program, know that you have to have first learned how to use DNA JetCom. When I do this program, I like to go online and show you some of the things that the program can do and then we'll come back to the slides and go through the explanations once by one by one. So hopefully we're going to go online. Okay, as you can see from this screen, I am a registered user of DNAGEDCOM.com. You must register if you're going to take advantage of the main tool we're going to discuss, the autosomal tool that analyzes the individual DNA segments. We'll talk about that in a minute, but this is the original cover page for DNAJEGCOM.com. As you can see, looking through the page, it helps you know what you need to do in order to register. It makes you aware of the fact that there is a DNA JEDCOM user group that you can go to to get answers to questions on Facebook. Here's an explanation of what you can do using DNA JEDCOM. I need to put a star here actually because this is the client that you have to download in order to do the other parts. We'll go to that in a minute too. There's also a blog post that gives more details on how to use some of the other utilities such as GWorks and if you look up here you can see these lists of utilities right underneath here how you would upload your JEDCOM files, manage tree files, search them, and other utilities that you can use. We are mainly going to discuss the autosomal tools tonight that include the DNA segment 
analyzer. It specifically mentions that if you are an adoptee looking for help, to check out this link. Remember, one of the original purposes of this site was to be able to have a place where you can combine all of your data from all of your companies in order to efficiently search for who may be related to you. They also have slides from a Jamboree presentation here. And if you notice here, it says if you have any issues, you can write to support at dnajegcom.com. Remember, all of these utilities are done by volunteers. And in the case of DNA JEGCOM, I suggest if you are in a position to be able to do so, that occasionally you send them a donation to keep sites like this going. Okay, the first thing we're gonna do is look at the toolbar up here so you can see how powerful this program actually is. We've discussed the home page. The second item on the toolbar discusses information about who they are and some troubleshooting techniques. And then over here, you get to see what kinds of things you may need to do to upload kits by company. So for instance, here's one that says upload ancestry DNA kits. If you click on it, it's going to give you details on how you do that. These things are all done through the DNA client tool that we'll discuss in a minute. And you may find this just a little bit confusing, but once you've created your files, you should be able to search and find your M file and your A file. And the most impressive one, the ICW tool, they're having some difficulties with it right now in terms of ancestry. And it says that it has been temporarily disabled because of performance issues. Tonight, we were going to emphasize how to do it with GEDmatch. If you notice, Jet, the GEDmatch tool is still considered to be beta. It's still under development. I'm going to come back and go through slides that specifically explain how to use DNA GEDmatch in order to take advantage of this utility. You can also go to Family Tree DNA tells you again, load the file from the DNA GEDCOM client. We're not going to get into detail on how to do it with Family Tree, but I will show you a couple of examples. You can see that I have a few files down here. I have recently updated my files in, from FTDNA. There are two. And a, a couple of years ago, I ran one based on my aunt's information and my uncle's information and they also are stored there. You can use 23andMe. Again, you have to click on the link and see what's required to add your 23andMe data to the gnajegcom.com site. Autosomal tools we're gonna to discuss in detail, especially the autosomal DNA segment analyzer. As I mentioned before, JWorks is a utility that we're not going to discuss tonight that allows you to create a spreadsheet using Excel. And KWorks is a similar tool, but it's web-based. GWorks allows you to compare GEDCOMs, if you have one of those. To create a GEDCOM, for instance, if you're on Ancestry, you have to go to Ancestry and see specifically how to create a GEDCOM file from your provider. Once you're a member, you can see that there's a list of the files that you have created over here. So if I click on mine, for instance, you can see that I have files that have been uploaded for different FTDNA kits. I've uploaded the GEDCOM. I have GEDmatch and some other things that I'm working on currently. And it stores those in the program permanently. You can see that I have ones in here that go back to 2015 when I first started playing with DNA GEDCOM. Here's an area where you can change your password. There's information on subscriber information and how you can change your account or email should you need to do those things. So now I want to show you live an example of what happens when you click on the autosomal DNA segment analyzer. 
I had planned to do this with GEDmatch, but since the in common with tool has been eliminated right now, I'm going to use a different company. My B7605 is from FTDNA, that's my kit number. You get a page like this, and I cannot emphasize enough, download the ADSA manual. This program is complex. There's a lot of things to try to wrap your head around. I don't think anyone can use this program successfully without also having the manual. So all you have to do is click on the link to get that. Also for the DNA climate documentation, which we'll go into a little bit later, they have steps described there in a link and also how to do a GEDmatch quick start guide, etc. We'll come back to this later. So for now, you get a page that looks something like this. And I'm going to start out with 15 centimorgans. The lowest they will go is 10. I'm going to try 15 to try to limit the size of the file that I'm going to have. Okay, so now I've chosen 15. I've left the default settings at 500. I inserted my kit number, and you can see there's a drop-down menu. So if you have other kit numbers from other companies, it will keep them stored there. And then all you do is click the report. And this is what you get. I personally love graphics. People that know me know that I love graphics. And this to me is really amazing. It goes through chromosome by chromosome if I scroll down. But interestingly, you could have chosen up here initially if you really want to focus on, say, chromosome 9. You can plug that in there, and it'll show you just the results for chromosome 9. But I let it compute them all for all right now, and then this is what you get. Now, we know that ethically, we are not supposed to expose names, email addresses, unless we have permission. I'm going to talk about this in broad terms, and then I'm going to come back to it and show you some slides where the names and information have been blocked out. Let me just say that this is in comparison, of course, to me. It is my FTDNA kit. And I can tell you that most of these initial people, like Tim Jones, is my full brother, and he knows I'm doing these kinds of presentations. Julie's a niece, James Ryan is an uncle, and so forth. And they're identified in there, along with the predicted relationship. What I think is really incredible is the in common with part of this program. So for instance, if I look across here, each one of these color-coded blocks are representative of a section of DNA that matches with me. And you can see, if I look at this first black segment, my brother shares 87.28 centimorgans with me. Now, I don't know if you saw what I just did, but just by hovering over this result, I think this is the real strength of this program because not only does it tell me how much I share on chromosome 1 in this position with my brother, but it also shows me, if I read down here, what is the longest shared block we have, segments that we share chromosome by chromosome, and more interestingly, you see below the list of people that also share that segment to some degree with me. Let me show you again how I can do that. I'll pick a smaller segment, for instance. If I go down here, Sonia Lang, it, it predicts as my third to fifth cousin, not a close match. Let me see if I can scroll down a little bit so that you can see what else I could find here. You can also see that not only does Sonia have this section of DNA in common with me, but so does, according to this list, Michael Dwyer, Tim Jones, Theodore Jones, Julie Jones. The last one is a designation for my cousin, Jean. Michael Dwyer is one of those interesting people in Ireland. I have Dwyers that came from Ireland. I haven't figured out our common ancestor yet, but you can see how valuable something like this could be. 
The other thing I really like about these graphics is you can see graphically right away just how long that particular strand of DNA is in common with me again. The Theodore Jones is my brother. It identifies him as a full brother. It tells me how many centimorgans we share in a list there. And again, what's really interesting is the number of people that also share that with me. So when I've done this presentation before, I've explained to people that I really want you to see how powerful it is once you've uploaded your data, how simple it is to be able to adjust chromosome matches, see who else is in the list. I just think it's a fantastic program. So now I'm going to get out of here and go back to the PowerPoint and get offline. All right, so that worked for us. So let me set it up from the current slide and we'll go on from there. Okay, we talked before about the welcome page of the DNA GEDCOM tools site and that the first thing you need to do is register if you haven't yet. We also talked about the toolbar at the top and the drop down menus. So you can also see then you're also going to have to download this DNA GEDCOM client, which we're going to talk about in detail a little bit more. We're going to focus on the autosomal DNA segment analyzer, abbreviated ADSA in this presentation. But as I mentioned before, there are several other programs contained within this program. So once you've downloaded the client, you're going to get a page like this that, again, I cannot emphasize enough. If you're going to try to use this particular tool, download this manual. And again, you can choose the number of centimorgans that you want to put in there. They suggest using five or higher. In this example, they use 10. Sometimes the easiest thing to do is go back and do 15. And then if you want to refine it, it's very simple to run the report again, because then you just click on get report and there you go. So from here on out, I can talk freely because everything's been blurred out. None of these are my relatives. I was given permission to use these slides. But in the, you're, you know that this is an example here for chromosome three. The person that ran this had 24 matching segments with individuals. And we're going to go through in a few minutes and explain what exactly the color coding means. You know from over here, it's going to list the length. And if you just hover over that tool, you're going to see who's in common with. Again, she was able to show when you just hover over what kind of output you're going to get. It predicted that whatever person she chose was a fifth cousin to remote. But on the other hand, it also listed all the people in the database that she uploaded who matched her on that same individual segment. So you have to set up an account. You register. They will send you a password. I'm going to say that sometimes I've had my password not accepted once I even had to write to them and they sort of had to clear my account. They say the simplest way to avoid that problem is to keep me logged in, but I don't necessarily like to do that. So if you run into a password problem and it says it's not accepted, just go through the password reset pro process. It won't be that long. Then within there, you have to download the DNA client app. And it's going to give you a link in order to be able to do that. There are two requirements to be able to do what I'm going to show you today. First of all, you have to be a paying subscriber to DNA GEDCOM client app. You can do that for $5 a month or $50 a year. And believe me, I think you're going to see that it's worth it. The wonderful things about these subscriptions is, uh, I would suggest keeping this one for sure, but you're going to also see you need it. If you're going to use GEDmatch, you have to be tier one. You don't have to keep those subscriptions going. 
But to me, this one is well worth it for my purposes. All right, so here we have an introduction to what they're talking about, the DNA JEGCOM client. They're now on version two, which is a Windows application. And they give you additional information and again mention that you can save 17% if you really know that you like the program by paying a $50 yearly fee instead of monthly. So you go to the link, you download it, and remember that this is one program that does require a subscription of $5 a month. The nice thing is you can use your DNA results from FTDNA. It says read caveat. Part of that has to do with the fact that FTDNA does not consider a match to be a match that's, that is less than 20 centimorgans. So even if you type in there, I want to see my matches down to 10 centimorgans, you're not going to see it on FTDNA. You can download your results for 23andMe. You can do it for Ancestry. You could have moved things from all three of these accounts over to GEDmatch and just used GEDmatch. But as I mentioned, GEDmatch is considered to be still in beta, and right now they've disabled the In Common With tool because of the difficulties they're having, which is one of the things I think is most important about this program. Again, you have to familiarize yourself with the toolbar in the drop-down menu. Click on DNA Kits, see what it says underneath there, and just keep moving to the right, and just get comfortable with the toolbar. All of these have a drop-down menu. In this case, one of the choices is Upload the GEDmatch DNA data, which they consider to be in beta development. Now, in order to use GEDmatch, you also have to be a Tier 1 member. If you're not familiar with GEDmatch, I suggest you go learn that program a little bit first and get comfortable with it at GEDmatch.com. You can do many of these same things without being a Tier 1 member. But in order to upload from GEDmatch versus Ancestry or FTDNA or 23andMe, you need to be a Tier 1 member. That will cost you $10 per month of access. And I want to emphasize per month of access because you could run these tools stored in files over there on dnagedcom.com and not have to be a continuing Tier 1 member. But there are a couple tools you're going to have to use in Tier 1. And believe me, again, these programs take a long time to generate the data. That bandwidth is not free. I think it's well worth the money for what you get. If you would like to, you can download a document that says specifically how to use the dnajegcom.com program in conjunction with GEDmatch. I want to mention again that I actually wrote to Rob Worth, the creator of the ADSA, and he gave me written permission to use some of the slides that I've used earlier in this presentation as part of this one. So my thanks to Rob for allowing me to do so. So if you're about to use GEDmatch, you go to this section on the toolbar and upload your GEDmatch DNA data. Now, one of the things that was a little bit confusing, and apparently it's something that a lot of people mess up a lot when they first initially use this, you're going to run your Tier 1 matching segment search list in GEDmatch. And once you have those results, you're going to cut and paste them into this box. And I'll show you the mistake a lot of people do. Then you go back and you run the Tier 1 triangulation tool. And in my opinion, this is a great tool to run overnight because this, depending on the number of matches that you have within GEDmatch, this one can take a long time to collect the data you need to upload. So, as I said, you run a Tier 1 matching segment search list. This is very important. 
Everybody that knows me knows I love those beautiful colored graphics, but in this case, you have to exclude the graphic. It's not going to be used in the program. Once you've loaded the data, copy and paste the entire window to the box and hit load. Let me say that again. When data is loaded within GEDmatch, you take the result and copy and paste the entire window to the box and hit load. They have a caution that they've found that all of these things work best if you're using a Google Chrome browser. They've had to troubleshoot other browsers and just find that this one works consistently better for this process. So this is the kind of output that you get in the matching segment search in GEDmatch. Those of you that have, have done this before are probably used to a table that looks something like this. It says, hint, a common error made in this step is to copy only the data in the table. If it were me and I got output like this, I'd want to start here, copy, and paste it from there. But their program is set up so that you can just do a control A, copy the entire page, and it accounts for these additional things at the top. It will delete them as part of the program. So just copy the entire output that you get. This is the screen that you're going to input your data in. Let me go back here. I accidentally... This is the table where you're going to import your results from GEDmatch. Uh, the easiest way if you're using a PC is to do control A, then control C to copy it. Control A selects everything on the page, then control C. Come over here and click control V and paste the entire thing. Once you've done that, click load. And once it's done that, it's going to give you some results down here of what it's been able to do. It takes about a minute or less than a minute for the data to load to DNA JEGCOM. And it says that you might see a message like waiting for response from DNA JEGCOM at the bottom left-hand side of the browser. After it's complete, you're going to see the information at the bottom that it will give you a match count, chromo count, and then you can clear the button and the box will be empty again once it's been uploaded. Then you run the triangulation utility in Tier 1 of GEDmatch. Again, you're going to take all of the data that you get. Don't try to cut out this informational stuff at the top. It's going to take that and take care of it for you. So once you've done that, in order to run the segment triangulation kit, you put in your GEDmatch kit number. They suggest that you leave the default at 3,000 centimorgans. And this is an important thing. Make sure that you choose this display option. We already know that they don't want graphics. This is the one that they need to use in conjunction with that program. And then skip the option to try show results both ways and go ahead and select triangulate. You'll get output similar to this. For, notice in red up here it says processing may take as much as 45 minutes. Do not refresh the screen or leave this page during that time. That's why I suggest a lot of times I do this and go to bed and it's all ready for me the next morning. Once again, you copy everything on that report, control A, control C, and then come over here and control P or paste it in there. They have that listed here, the copy and paste on Windows. Click in the window, control A, then control C, go to the box and click control V. Then load, and up it goes. You'll know it's loaded when you look down here and you see exactly what the match count is, the chromosome count. And so once that's happened, you've finished and you can clear the screen.
So now that you've got things loaded back into the client program, you can use, and I suggest again you use this ADSA manual to run the report. This is an important caution in my opinion because I'm one of these people that tend to get excited even about small segments. And this is a table that is posted on ISOG, the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. And it's borrowed from a man named John Walden. What this table shows clearly is if you're searching at the 11th centimorgan level, you can bet that matches that you pick up are 99% inherited by descent, on, and only 1% identity by state. Now, identity by state, you can look up some of the definitions for these terms if you're not familiar with them within ISOG, but they refer to them as false segments. They're not I identity by descent, they're identity by state, as you notice in this table, the longer the segment, the more likely the segment is due to there actually being a match along the same chromosome. On the flip side, a lot of people like to go down to, say, five centimorgans. Well, look at this. You can see that identity by descent is only 5% of the matches, and most of them are identity by state. So if you're using these things to try to identify possible relationships or the most recent common ancestor, it's obvious from this table that the larger the centimorgans are, the more likely you are to get the, the matches that count for your purposes. Again, this is what the output looks like. And believe me, I've told you about this over here and you can see graphically the length of the centimorgan relative to other people. You can see how the segments overlap. I showed you that if, if what you're using has an in common with feature and it hasn't been disabled, you can see all the people that also share that. And what you want to see are blocks like this. But what does all this mean and what are these hashtags? It took me the longest time to be able to understand this again it's very detailed in the manual and I'll give you a few of the common examples near the end of the presentation so what is a triangulated group I belong to Blaine Bettinger's Facebook page and I noticed that he put a caution up at the top of his page the other day that suggested that we define what we mean when we're when we're discussing a triangulated group he actually listed three definitions and said make sure when you're posting on this particular Facebook page that you explain what you mean maybe by a triangular group. I happen to like this definition. To get a triangulated group, and by the way, if you don't know why you want a triangulated group, those, that's a series of people that are in common with you and each other. And therefore, you can pretty well count on the fact that you have a common ancestor as a group. And so in order to do that, number one, pick out a nice long segment in your ADSA output. And the reason you want to do that is because you want to make sure that the segment is identity by descent. Then look for all the segments that overlap it. Use the in common with tool to see matches for people associated with these segments and make sure the matches match everybody else. If you have met all three of those conditions, you can assume pretty safely that the owners of those segments probably all share a common ancestor with you and you are all part of a triangulated group. See what you can deduce about the common ancestor by looking at your matches ancestral surnames. So we have to talk about an endogamous population such as a Jewish Ashkenazi group. Uh, Jewish genealogy has special challenges because for several hundred years 
Many times they were confined to ghettos or small villages. They largely intermarried with each other, and therefore, when I in a place where I might typically get a thousand matches, someone doing Jewish ge genetic genealogy may get five thousand matches because the populations become what we refer to as endogamous. They married each other within the community and therefore inherited a lot of the same DNA. So you might get a result that looks something like this. If I check out these boxes that are um, enclosed in green, you can see that it's many, many people who share all the same DNA. It makes it harder, there's no doubt about it. That's why also sometimes genetically uh, the Jewish population may be prone to more diseases specific to them, such as Tay-Sachs, if you've heard of that one. So now you've got these results. How do you interpret them? Once again, download the manual on how to use the autosomal DNA segment analyzer. In particular, you want to look at the section on interpreting your results. Here are a few examples. You want to look for boxes like this. I highlighted this one in red. Small rectangles on a diagonal line of slashes. And for the most part, what those slashes indicate is that with this particular group, about half the DNA might be to the right of the group, half to the left. Uh, it just sort of is a tool there for helping you figure out all the people that match you and each other. Once you've found those, you might see something like this. You see this entire group of obvious relationships here, and then you see what they refer to as missing teeth, the little white segments. And you're pretty sure that they're related to the rest of the group, and they probably are. One of the things that can cause you to get missing teeth, for instance here, is that family tree DNA doesn't declare it a match until there's a minimum of 20 set of Morgans shared across all the chromosomes. So maybe some of these other ones were matches that came through ancestry that had been transferred to GEDmatch or 23andMe, and you've downloaded results from FTDNA, and it looks like they're not a match, but in fact, they probably are. As they say, if you want to be sure, just go to GEDmatch and run uh, both a one-to-many and a one-to-one -one utility, and that'll help you rule someone in or out. Here's another example. Again, I'm glad the manual explained this to me because I would have never figured this one out on my own. This is a representation of a triangulated group within a triangulated group. You can see there's sort of reddish and green bars at the top and the bottom, and then the two in the middle have like a pale green and purplish color. They are a triangulated group within, like it says, a triangulated group. So how can that be? Well, as explained over here, this usually means that the two segments in the center are matching one parental chromosome of the pair, and the ones surrounding it are matching the other. Remember that we get maternal and paternal DNA in approximately an equal ratio. Given that, it could be that it could be on, tri on triangulated groups. So, in this example, as you can see, there seems to be an outlier. You can see the top row and all four of the bottom rows match each other and the person. So, what is going on? In this row here, where somebody matches 8.27 centimorgans, but nothing else. Well, once again, it probably is from the other parent. The top person and the bottom people share basically the same segments, and that may be either from mom or dad, and probably the other person is either from the opposite parent or it's not identity by the scent chromosome segment. Instead, it's one that is identity by state.
To take advantage of using this particular tool, let me remind you again that you have to register at dnajegcom.com. You have to download the DNA JEGCOM client. You have to pay $5 for a month-long subscription fee. And although you do not have to use GEDmatch, if you want to use GEDmatch, then you're going to have to join Tier 1 and pay your 10 bucks for a month-long subscription. One thing I also found a little bit confusing is that the password for DNA JEGCOM will always be used on the DNA JEGCOM client. You don't set them up with separate passwords. They will be rejected. So make sure that these two are in sync with the same password. If you change one in DNA JEGCOM, uh, it'll probably pick it up because it's linked through there. You always upload DNA JEGCOM first and then click on the link to the client and go from there. So I hope you found this talk valuable. I love this tool. Again, if you ever hope to use something like Genome Mate Pro, you have to start out by creating files in dnajegcom.com. So I think it's definitely worth it, even though the setup may take you a bit of time and be confusing. If you run into problems, again, remember that there are Facebook groups there ready to help. Thank you so much for coming tonight, and I will be putting this talk online as soon as possible. Thank you.